It's really great to be here with all of you. Good evening, the good people of Passaic County and New Jersey 11th. When I was driving over here tonight, I, it was beautiful. I turned on the radio in my five minute drive from Montclair and there on WNYC was a report about a robocall from the Congressman Ron, Rodney Freelingheisen last night. And the one, there was a clip actually taped, of, an audio clip of the Congressman speaking it was one question that was asked, which was presumably by one of you, are you gonna be at the town hall in Passaic on Wednesday? And he said, among other things, that these town halls, these four town halls that we've arranged and invited him to and invited an extraordinary, huge panel, many, many experienced and intelligent and expert people to talk about the issues of the day, he said that they were unauthorized. So, nonetheless, we are very happy to be here in our peaceful assembly for our civic duty authorized by the Constitution of the United States of America. And I would respectfully like to ask the congressman to remember under whose authority he serves in the United States Congress. I also wanted to just have a few quick thank yous, never enough thank yous. This team is enormous and extraordinary. But thank you to the local 464A for letting us come and use this big hall. Apparently the likes of Bill Clinton and Cory Booker have graced this humble stage and, and now Flat Rodney gets the honor. And I'd also like to thank the, myself exempted, obviously, but the, the really terrific tech team that's here to make you hear me and see the slides and also that we're streaming on Facebook and Periscope so that the people who couldn't come, couldn't get a ticket or had other plans or couldn't make it, will be able to see it and listen to it. And a big thank you to Elsa, who also couldn't be here tonight, who's done her very best in trying circumstances to make sure that all four venues are as accessible as possible. Yes, thank you, Elsa. Elsa watching at home. So again, we do wish that the congressman could have been here with us, but nonetheless, we will honor one of our founding traditions, which is to gather in a town hall community forum to discuss the issues of the day. It's a tradition that dates back before our Declaration of Independence, and it carries on to here in this hall in 2017. We have an amazing, really, truly extraordinary panel of people to come to discuss and answer the questions that some of you may have, but there are lots of questions that are not for really fairly any of these panelists. They're for our Congressman, Mr. Freelingheisen. And it's, it's Freelingheisen, I'm pretty sure, if you're wondering, Freelingheisen. So now we can all say it. Um, so we're gonna keep the focus on us and on the Congressman for just a few minutes, and then we will introduce the panel and we'll have a, a, quite an edifying conversation. Um, so, firstly, for those of you who have cell phones, take them out. And we're going to sign on. Deborah, are you ready for us? Ready. Slowly. You're going to sign on to uh, like a live voting, like uh, American Idol style live voting. Maybe you've seen if you've watched the, the screens. It's called live.voxvote. It's voxvote.com, live.voxvote.com. I'm glad she knows what she's doing here. 
So in the meantime, while you're logging on and while Deborah's working, I had, um, there were a couple of questions, a show of hands. Is there anyone here from Rodney Frelinghuysen's office? No? Okay. Um, is there anyone here besides the press who's getting a paycheck? No? No? How about, is there anyone here, since we're here at the local 464A, is there anyone here who's either a union member themselves or has a family member who's a union member? Great. Nice to see you. Are we ready? We're good. Okay. So, what's the question? Oh, yes, the code. Oh, thank you. Perfect question. 18514. I repeat, 18514. Everyone ready? Okay, so here's our first question. Which three issues are of most concern to you today as a constituent of New Jersey 11's Congressional District? And we'll refresh. Wow, women's rights is winning the night tonight. Close second with health care. Yeah, no, no, we're, there's only eight votes so far. Can people at home vote? Yes, they can. Hey, you Facebook users, vo live.voxvote.com. 18514 and vote. Ah, 50 users, there we go. Women's rights and health care. Environmental policy. All right, we're going to, oh, 90. Yep, we're holding steady. These are the issues for us here in Passaic County tonight. Next slide. All right, next question, ladies and gentlemen. How have you tried to get in touch with your congressman in the past month? You can phone, any of the above, all of them. Phone, postal mail, email, in-person visit, social media. That would be people who tweet or write on his Facebook page. 18514. 118 votes, lots of different ways. Yeah, we're trying our hardest. People even fax. <laughs> I sent a fax myself. All right, next question. How many times have you tried to reach out to your congressman in the past month? Zero. One to two, three to five, six to nine. Oh, the six to nine, that's a lot. That's more than once a week. 15 plus, extraordinary. This really shows the effort. Was anyone here on the robocall last night? Oh, look it, there's many hands, at least half a dozen, but you still felt the need to come here and be heard. That wasn't enough, is that right? All right, and our last question? Two more. Oh, two more. In the past month, have you received a response from Representative Freelinghuysen? Yes, but it did not answer my question. No. 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 All right. I've seen enough. It's too depressing. Okay, and the last question. On a scale from one to five, how would you rate Representative Freelinghuysen's communication with constituents. This would include if you've been a guest at a pasta dinner or in a middle school classroom. <laughs> yeah. So the completely or mostly unresponsives are more than 94%, more than 97%. Okay. It's funny but sad. Right? Okay, so that's us, and that's our efforts. Now let's see if I can figure out how to get to Teddy. Thanks, Teddy. I practiced this too. So there's a couple of slides. Yes. For the, for the voting records. You actually have these as a handout, so you don't have to wait for the slide. There's a, a handout of Rodney's voting record. There's slides and facts. That's it. We'll just leave this, this, this one. Yeah. That one. There you go. So this shows over time. There's um, quite a few national organizations that rate 
members of Congress and other elected officials on certain issues. So this tracks um, the National Environmental Scorecard from the League of Conservation Voters, Planned Parent Action Fund ratings, um, the National Education Association, and the NRA. That's the red line. So, and these are ratings collected from the late 90s um, all the way to 2016. And it's, the ratings themselves I think are quite clear and self-explanatory. The question of why an individual representative would change their mind so drastically on these issues of great importance is one that we really can't answer without him here. Um, one of the other little recordings from the robocall last night, if you weren't on it or didn't get the phone call, couldn't call in because there was no way to call in, was um, somebody asking, I think they were from Mendham, asking about his, it was a gentleman, his change in his support for Planned Parenthood and for women's rights to choose. And the congressman was crystal clear, crystal clear that he supported Planned Parenthood and a woman's right to choose. That is what he said on this phone call. And when asked why his votes didn't reflect that support at all, which you can see on your, on your list on the back of that sheet here, it's a list of votes. There's two votes here that affect abortion access and not just abortion access, but funding for all kinds of women's health and men's health issues, Title X funding. His explanation was, this isn't a quote because there's no transcript, but I heard it. His explanation was that there are other colleagues of his who have different opinions on these issues. So I can't really offer you any more logic than that. So that's us, and for the moment, that's our congressman. Here's a, a little summary of the votes so far, pertinent votes in the 115th Congress. You have them on the back of your sheet as well um, for your perusal and edification. But what we're going to do, and this is going to be brief. This is a little different from the other town halls if you've been watching. We have questions that can't be answered really appropriately by anybody but Rodney Freelingheisen or potentially someone from his staff. But we really need to ask them. So I know some of you were in the Instagram booth in the back and had some recorded and we'll make sure that we do our best to make him see those questions. But we're gonna ask some questions right now from all of you. This is a more or less empty stage. I'm gonna step off. We have our Rodney stand in. Um, but if you have a burning question, that is specifically for the congressman, this would be an opportunity. We're filming and the people at home, and I'll ask for a show of hands who agrees, but just so that we can get the most out of tonight, no stories or, or lectures, please just get right to your question. So Representative uh, Freilingheisen is uh, the head of the Appropriations Committee. And he's responsible for the budget and, and passing things through the budget. And part of uh, the 45's administration's plan for cutting spending in the budget is defunding VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act. And um, I work for, in the district, there's four lead domestic violence agencies that provide services for thousands of women and men. Um, we're talking about shelter and counseling and things of that sort, legal services to protect them from their abusers. And, uh, you know, one of the major things that they're talking about cutting funding is the Violence Against Women Act. So I would like to know what um, the representative's views are on that and if he does support victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Who else would like to know the answer to that question? No? Which one in the back? Hi. Oh, hello. How are you doing? Yeah, and, and when you ask a question, why not say your first name and the town that you're from? Hi, my name's Mike. I'm from Cedar Grove. Hi, everyone. 
Uh, my, uh, my question for the representative Frelinghuysen uh, has to do with campaign finance reform in part. Uh, I kind of wonder from him who he feels he's responsible to, whether it be constituents, corporate constituents, i.e. businesses here within the 11th district, you know, industries, whatever, or just corporations, you know. The, the corporations that can give him the most money as opposed to his constituents who hopefully will support him financially, but most importantly on election day with our votes to either elect him or hopefully get rid of him. That's My name is Patty, and I'm from Nutley. Assemblyman Freelingheisen, as one of your constituents, I am deeply troubled by Russian interference in our presidential election and about the allegations that the Trump campaign cooperated with Russian government officials. Rex Tillerson, Paul Manafort, and Michael Flynn all clearly show how closely associated with Russia the Trump administration really is. Donald Trump himself refuses to release his tax returns to the American public, which prove that he is beholden to Russian interests. Assemblyman Freelinghuysen, would you support a select committee to aggressively investigate Donald Trump's ties to Russia? My name is Naomi, I live in West Orange, and I would like to ask the representative the uh, following question. In the 1990s, when Newt Gingrich was trying to cut everything that was lovely and beautiful about our country, as in the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, um, you actually voted to keep those organizations going and to fund them. Would you do the same now? Robin from Wayne, um, I was on the robocall last night. It was unbelievable. So I'd like to ask him why he chuckled his way through last night when he spoke about the president's tweets. He spoke about the tax returns and lit and, and owned about making his product and Ivanka's product in China. And the congressman just chuckled his way through last night as if it was funny. So I'd like to know from him what's it going to take to actually rebuke this absolute nonsense rather than chuckling through. Also last night when asked about the cabinet post, those of you that were on heard him say, it's not my job, we don't vote for the cabinet post, it's the Senate, not my job. So I'd like to know when he is going to take any responsibility. As a school board trustee from Wayne, New Jersey, my question to the congressman is, what do you plan to do to protect our special needs students with Ms. DeVos as our Secretary of Education? So this, is, this will be our last question in this section because we're gonna have the panel come up and there will be lots of opportunity to ask questions at the end. I'm Jim, I live in Little Falls, and I'd like to ask Congressman Freelingheisen, given the cast of characters that is now assembled in the White House, several of whom people very broadly consider to be dangerous, uh, unsympathetic to most co different people, um, what would it take for you, what kind of an emergency would it take for you to start answering questions directly with what we need to do as a country to deal with an emergency that <clears throat> people like Steve Bannon, Steve Miller, and Mr. Trump might precipitate? Thank you. That's a good question. 
So we're going to squeeze in one more. Bob, that was a terrific question. All terrific questions. So Donald Trump has proposed a border wall that would cost billions of dollars. And you, Frelinghuysen, as head of the House Appropriations Committee, has a lot have a lot of control over this. So would you oppose a border wall? Thank you. Um, it gets frustrating and it's hard to remain congenial as, as we really are at NJ 11th for change and throughout the district. It's, it is and it's effective to be respectful and congenial, but it's very difficult in the face of no answer. So I would encourage all of you who either asked, those were extraordinarily well-formed questions, well-informed questions as well, write to the letter, letter to the editor those questions precisely and keep it up. So now we're gonna introduce some really wonderful people who are willing to be here tonight to give you some answers and to give you some insight into the questions of the day. We're truly honored for all of them. Um, I'm very pleased that John Bartlett, who is a Passaic County freeholder, will come and take the chair as moderator. Um, he lives right, right next door in Wayne. It's his fifth year of elected service on the Passaic County Board of Chosen Freeholders. Freeholder Bartlett has been personally involved over the past year in the resettlement of 15 Syrian refugee families in the Patterson area. And in advocating for and supporting this vulnerable population. And Dan Casino, who's an associate professor of political science at Farley Dickinson University. He also serves as director of experimental research for the university's independent research group, Public Mind, and the author of, among many works, Fox News and American Politics How One Channel Shapes American Politics and Society. Tom Hilliard, who is uh, a, on the steering committee here at NJ 11th for Change, but also was the former director of health policy to the public advocate of New York City. He also served as assistant director of adult medicine at Governor Healthcare Services, a clinic in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and is currently senior researcher at the Center for an Urban Future. <laughs> Les Leopold is the director of and founder of the Labor Institute. He's currently working with unions and community organizations to build the educational infrastructure of a new reversing runaway inequality. And I'll just say he donated those books for NJ 11th for change to sell or give. You can log on to our website and make a, a donation for that. We really are quite appreciative. But more than that, it gets Les's extraordinary message out. And Doug O'Malley, Director of Environment New Jersey, coordinating a staff of 20 to educate more than 60,000 Central Jersey citizens on pressing environment issues. He serves on the board of Work Environment Council, Environment America, and Environmental Endowment for New Jersey, and is a member of the Better Choices Coalition and Anti-Poverty Network. <laughs> Far from least. But last is Carol Ruiz, who is the co-president of Wind of the Spirit Immigrant Resource Center, volunteer immigration lawyer, and the co-chair of the United People of Color Caucus of the National Lawyers Guild. Okay, well, good evening. My name is John Bartlett. I'm a Passaic County freeholder. I'm not going to ask you what that is, but if you want to find out, we literally have a brochure called What is a Freeholder? <laughs> and it's uh, over there on the table. Uh, we're not here to talk about the freeholder board, but about Congress. Um, we're in Little Falls, but this is a big crowd. Give yourselves a round of applause. 
Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to be part of the panel as a moderator. Uh, it's so nice to be here. I've been part of the Facebook group from the beginning. I've been watching all the incredible organizing everyone is doing, uh, the excellent, uh, thoughtful comments that are coming out on Facebook, as well as, most importantly, Fridays with Frühlingheisen, which is just doing amazing stuff every Friday and, and bringing this home to folks. You guys are standing up for what you believe in and standing up for us and our communities uh, and our kids. And that means a great deal to me because standing up is something that we have some experience out here in Passaic County in 2013 when Governor Chris Christie said, we're going to have two separate elections 20 days apart because I want my victory lap in November and we're going to elect Cory Booker to the U.S. Senate on a Wednesday in October. Passaic County Board of Chosen Freeholders stood up, said you can't do that. It's going to cost our taxpayers almost $2 million. Likewise, 2015, the governor said, no Syrian refugees in this state, not even a five-year-old orphan. Your Passaic County freeholders stood up and said, no, this is a place where all are welcome. And regrettably, <laughs> regrettably, we had to stand up and say just the same thing again last week uh, in response to the president's executive order, but we did pass a resolution saying that Passaic County is a place, regardless of where you came from or how you got here, where you and your families are welcome and we value you as part of the community. Now, when it comes to Washington, D.C., we've got a lot more standing up to do. Um, if you don't know this already, you should know that here in New Jersey, for every tax dollar we send to Washington, D.C., we get 54 cents back. And that is just one of many things that we need to be standing up for and making sure that our congressmen, including Congressman Frühlingheisen, listen to the concerns of the constituents. Um, the congressman has been on the Appropriations Committee for years, as somebody pointed out. Um, uh, the dividends of that uh, are not coming back in that 54 cents. Um, and if anything, uh, the congressman's position in that regard is particularly worrisome because whereas uh, Republican Representative Tom Cole of Oklahoma used to call the Appropriations Committee a firewall against the Obama agenda. He now calls it the tip of the spear for the agenda of our 45th president. So this position and the position that Congressman Frühlingheisen occupies in particular is very important and very, very worrisome. I want to go to the, our panel of experts and I want to start by asking a question specifically uh, to begin to Dan Casino, a Fairleigh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. I looked on the website 538 today, uh, Dan, and, I, and they have a ranking on there called Tracking Congress in the Age of Trump. And of the many, many 435 congressmen, Congressman Frühlingheisen is the highest scorer uh, in New Jersey on what I might call the Trumpiness <laughs> scale in Washington 2017. Um, there's been just a few votes in Congress so far, but the congressman has voted 100 percent with the agenda of President Trump. And I guess that's an appropriate, uh, in combination with what we already saw here, the appropriate question is, he's not listening to us, so who's he listening to? Well, I think that's, a, I think that's an excellent question, so we have to ask, what game is the congressman playing? And I think it's important to understand the congressman is not a bad person. I've met him a number of times in professional capacity. He's a gentleman. And I think it's important that we understand you don't hate the player, you hate the game. If you don't like the outcome, you don't demonize, you don't villainize. You understand the incentives. You understand what is leading someone to act in the way that they're acting. So Congressman Freelinghuisen, if we could bring up my slides, because the slides are relevant here. Uh, so Congressman Freelinghuisen, yes, at this, up to this point has voted 100% on party line with party orthodoxy. Uh, that's actually not unusual. As was already noted, Congressman Freelinghuisen is the chair of one of the most powerful commissions in Congress, one of the most powerful panels in Congress. And as a result, you would expect that if he were to go against party leadership, uh, it would look very bad for him, having just gotten that role. We also have to understand what Cog so uh, what just came up is Congress from Freeland Hoisen's uh, votes if we go back to 1995. So if you look on the left-right spectrum of that, that'll tell you where he's standing on the left to right. And you see he's actually 
fairly centrist over that whole period. It's certainly been the case he has drifted to the right, uh, but he's drifted to the right mostly along with his district. That is, if you were to take a look at where he was before the Tea Party uh, exploded in about 2009 and where he was after that, he moved very far to the right after the Tea Party showed up. Uh, part of that's because the Tea Party basically was founded in Morristown, in his hometown, and he responded to that, and he moved pretty far to the right. If we look on average, it's, uh, he's pretty moderate, but uh, since 20, 2009, 2010, he's moved pretty far to the right. The other thing we have to understand about his record is that he doesn't have a record of really a lot of leadership in Congress. So on that same slide, the top to bottom is the degree of leadership, and we measure that by looking at uh, how many bills he sponsors versus how many bills he signs on to. And you can see he doesn't actually sign on, he signs on a lot of bills, he doesn't actually sponsor that much. He's been very much a backbencher uh, for most of his time in Congress, just kind of doing what he's been told to do. Uh, if we go on the next slide. Yeah. So if you want to understand what he's doing, you have to understand what members of Congress are there to do. Now we like to believe that members of Congress are there to respond to their constituents, but they are not. A member of Congress's job, number one, is to get reelected. Once their reelection is assured, and Representative Frayling Hoysen has won his last reelection bids with about 60% or more of the vote, then they can start to move on to step two. And step two is to gain influence in Congress. So how do you gain influence in Congress? The biggest way you do that is by kicking money up. And this is something a lot of people don't realize, is that if you want to get a good committee assignment in Congress, you have to pay for it. The way you pay for it is by getting, is by raising a lot of money, taking the money you don't need, and giving that to other members of Congress, and what's called a leadership pack, or giving it back to the party. If you're on a good committee in Congress, so if you're on the Veteran Affairs Committee, nobody cares. You know you're not gonna raise any extra money, the leadership isn't gonna expect anything out of you. If you're on appropriations, if you're a rank and file member of the Appropriations Committee, you're expected to kick back up a minimum of $85,000 a year up to the National Republican, National, uh, National Republican Congressional Committee. Last year, so we can, uh, last year, and we'll see this in a slide or two, uh, Representative Fraley was in, during last cycle, kicked up around $300,000 to the NRCC. Now, he raised far more money than he needed. He spent about a million dollars on his reelection campaign. He raised a lot more than that, and so he was able to kick that money back up. And that's a big part of how you get a better committee assignment. That's not just Democrat, uh, Republicans. Nancy Pelosi is Speaker of the House in large part because she represents Berkeley. She raises more money than she knows what to do with, and she can kick that money up to the committee and give that money to lots of other members of Congress, and that supports her. So if you want to know why Representative Franklin Hose is doing what he's doing, it's because as far as he is concerned, his reelection is assured. He doesn't have to worry about that. <clears throat> he raises more money than he needs to for to win his reelection. And so his goal is, number one, to get influence. To get influence, he has to raise money. He raises money primarily from very large corporations. Uh, his biggest donor is a company called IDT here in New Jersey. A lot of law firms, a lot of other groups like that, they're interested in lobbying. Give him a lot of money. He needs that money, number one, for re-election, but number two, so he can pay his dues and keep his committee assignments. Then, and again, I think we, it's always a mistake to demonize or villainize anyone, once he gets to a position of power and a position of prestige, by doing all of that, then he can do what he feels is really important. And Representative Franklin has made clear that he believes cutting taxes, repealing the ACA, that these are things he feels are important. And now he's in a position of power, he can start to do that. And that also tells you a lot about how you can get leverage over someone like Congressman Franklin Hosner, any member of Congress. The key is to change that calculation. Right now, Representative Franklin Hosner is saying, we don't need to worry about groups like this. That you, he does not believe, and members of Congress in general, Republicans and American Congress, do not believe that these groups will sustain themselves until the election. They believe that either, some of them, I don't think anyone actually believes that you're all funded by George Soros. <laughs> I, they're saying that, but you kind of have to say that. Uh, rather, they believe that this will fizzle out, this will be, you'll be distracted, you'll go on to do other things, and they will be able to do the things they want to do. As far as they're concerned, these groups, President Trump, are a distraction from the things they really want and really feel are important for them to do. If you want him to change that, you have to show him that that is not the case, that you're not going to just go away, that his reelection is not necessarily assured, that he is going to have trouble raising money, that he is going to have trouble winning reelection if he keeps on what he's doing, what he's doing right now. 
the important thing to remember is you have to change the game. And the game at this point is he has to believe his re-election is assured and he has to believe he can raise all the money he needs. If either of those gets threatened, his priorities will change very quickly. Not because he's a bad guy, but because he's just playing the game. Sounds like that's the beginning of a roadmap for us. Um, what I'm going to do by moderating this panel is give each of our panelists an opportunity to speak briefly about their area of expertise, um, as Dan just did, and then open the floor and facilitate questions uh, from you as the audience. I want to move on to Tom Hillard uh, and your expertise, Tom, on health policy. Uh, there's very interesting data that I saw from New Jersey policy perspective today, which I think is worrisome. You do? Oh, awesome. Um, for here in Passaic County, uh, with our 502,000 residents, re repealing the Affordable Care Act would be devastating. 76,000 residents would lose benefits. $330 million in federal funding would be lost each year. 6,700 jobs would be lost, particularly in healthcare, places like our two major hospitals, St. Joseph Patterson and of Wayne. Uh, and New Jersey policy perspective estimates, 60 people would die in Passaic County due to losing <clears throat> their health insurance. So uh, my question for you, Tom, is Congressman Frulingheisen says that the Affordable Care Act is failing and that he's trying to save it. Is that true? And what should the congressional plan for the ACA really look like? Thanks so much. Uh, I would just make the first observation if, we're, if we want to know whether ACA is failing. Uh, if you've looked at the news lately, you might have seen that people are attending town hall meetings in pretty large numbers. And they are attending these town hall meetings and they are demanding that their members of Congress save the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> One constituent of Senator Charles Grassley, who is famous during the enactment of the Affordable Care Act for saying that it would create death panels, said, we're going to have one national death panel and you're going to create it. And so evidently, these people don't think that the Affordable Care Act is failing. You know, the fact is there are things that we could do better in the Affordable Care Act, and it would be so great to have a conversation about those things. I heard President Obama say that he believes that the Affordable Care Act would be so much more effective if we boosted the subsidies going to low-income, middle-income working people, and we created a public option in each state. So. Nobody is saying that it's where it should be. But what we are saying is that it is the framework for an effective national health coverage uh, plan. So there was a point when we could all laugh at Congress for saying uh, they have no plan. In fact, I remember back in December, I got a letter from Rodney Frelinghuysen, who says he doesn't write letters, huh? uh, in which he said uh, that the Affordable Care Act is failing, but we have a plan to fix it. Well, it turned out they didn't have a plan. Uh, but as of last week, they do, or at least they have the beginnings of it. One Republican congressman said, well, it's a bit of a smorgasbord. <laughs> and that may be generous, but nonetheless, the principles are there. Uh, I wonder if we could have the second slide. I'm going to slip right past the first one. We'll try, Tom. We'll try. All we can ask. Uh, so uh, the Republican congressional plan is twofold. Of course, the main components of the Affordable Care Act are to expand Medicaid uh, which turned out to be optional for each day, and New Jersey accepted the expansion, which has been hugely valuable for us, uh, and to create exchanges so that people on the individual health coverage market would be accepted even if they had pre-existing conditions. And, uh, and to start with Medicaid, the bar here has been set by Donald Trump, who said uh, in a tweet, uh, which has since been printed out and carried to the floor of Congress by Bernie Sanders, that 
that there will that. I am the I was the Republican the first Republican candidate to say that there would be no cuts in Medicaid, Medicare, or Social Security, and that no one would lose any of their benefits. So that's the bar. Uh, but the uh, uh, Speaker Paul Ryan uh, unveiled a plan that will abolish New Jersey's Medicaid expansion. It would. Uh, return the, sh the federal share from 90%, which New Jersey and almost any state could, could uh, sustain because we're just paying 10% of it, and we get that back in reduced charity care costs, to 50%, uh, which is our normal Medicaid share. And given New, Jersey, New, J New Jersey's uh, financial problems, that would be the end of it. We'd just pull the plug. So every single person uh, who receives uh, expanded Medicaid would basically lose it. Uh, and in addition, all of Medicaid would be turned into either a block grant or a per capita grant, and that means that it would gradually lose its value uh, uh, because it wouldn't rise with inflation. And as soon as there's a recession, many people would lose their eligibility or have their benefits cut back. Uh, and a block grant, it would be, would be devastating to New Jersey in particular. And as I mentioned earlier, that block grant would not include uh, our expansion. And so we would literally be worse off than we were before the Affordable Care Act was passed. And then the plan for the exchanges, for anyone who's on uh, individual health coverage. By the way, is there anyone here who's on an exchange? So um, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, because there would still be a tax credit, uh, a, a subsidy, but that subsidy, that tax credit, would be a flat subsidy uh, for everyone. And so if you made 20000 a year or $2 million a year or 200000 a year, you would still get the same subsidy. Uh, so it would no longer support low-income people. They would expand health savings accounts so that uh, all that money that you're saving uh, at the end of the month, you could then turn over to uh, go towards the uh, $10,000 or $20,000 deductible, uh, which is, sounds pretty reasonable to me, right? Uh, and then uh, I wonder what they would do for people with really serious chronic conditions, uh, because the Republican plan to date has been a high-risk pool, which is, for various reasons, has never worked very well. And they're not even going to do that. They would basically create a slush fund for governors called the Social Innovation Grant. So they just give it to the governors to spend in any way they like. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then they would eliminate the individual mandate, which is how we get young and healthy people into the plans so that we can actually, so that insurers can actually afford to cover uh, people with, with chronic conditions and who come to an insurance plan with pre-existing conditions. So uh, this is what we have to look forward to if the House of Representatives passes its plan, and this is the choice that Rodney Frelinghuysen will be faced with. And I think it is perfectly reasonable for us to ask him whether he will support it, since he voted for much of it in 2015. So, uh, so we, have, uh, we have a lot to be concerned about. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as you all heard earlier, Les Leopold is the author of Runaway Equality with copies available right here for free for those who donate online at nj11thforchange.org. And somebody's going to correct me if I got that URL wrong. But in the meantime, uh, Les is, oh, good. <laughs> You don't usually start introducing someone and have them leave the stage. But now... <laughs> I have to duck. Now, now I think I understand what's going on. So I guess the question I want to lead you into your uh, um, presentation with, Les, is, uh, you know, uh, this... It's always struck me that one of the big challenges in talking about the economy is making sure that we all mean the same thing with the words that we're using. Uh, surveys show that way more people think of themselves as middle class than the economists define as middle class. People who make uh, relatively high incomes think they're middle class, 
particularly here in a place like New Jersey, uh, and those who are actually struggling a lot more than their neighbors also think of themselves as, as middle class. So h how do we find this common vocabulary for a conversation? And also, who do we need to be talking to about income inequality in the 21st century? Great. Uh, good question. And uh, first of all, I want to I'm so proud to be in front of my friends and neighbors, some of whom I haven't seen since kids' sports activities. But I'm really surprised to see so many outside agitators here. <laughs> it's, it's just remarkable. So uh, what I do for a living is go around and give talks about uh, income inequality all over the country. I've been blessed to be invited all over the place. So what you're going to get is the 45 minute wrap. You're getting the first minute and the last minute. So let me start. When, when, there you go. A man who wants some brevity. I don't blame him. Uh, uh, when you ask the American people what they think the income gap is between a top CEO and an average worker, they'll say around 45 to 1, which was, that's what it was in 1970. Uh, think about what that means for a second. It means that if you could afford one car, a CEO could, the top CEO could afford 45 cars. One home for you, 45 homes for them. Watch what's happened. Last data, data we have is 844 to 1. 844 to 1. What I want to explain is how uh, the, the voters I'm concentrating on are the ones that voted for Obama, then Bernie, and then out of sheer frustration, voted for Trump, or didn't vote at all. I think we can reach these people, but we have to understand what they are experiencing. Let me show you this. This is the only one that's going to be on your final exam tonight. You get extra credit for this one. Uh, this is productivity in the United States since 1947. It's gone up and up and up every single year, virtually. It's been flat a couple of years, but very few. Uh, and it's, it's the measure of how much we produce per hour of labor. And it, ha it really measures the wealth of nations. It, mean, it leaves a lot of things out, but it's a pretty good measure of what we can do uh, in our country. This is the average weekly wage in current dollars from 1947 till today. And from 47 till the late 70s, or mid 70s, uh, as productivity rose, so did real wages. I was in graduate school right here, and they told us it was an iron law. Had to go up together. No sooner did I graduate, they repealed the law. <laughs> now, real wages actually went down. For the bottom half of the country, they actually lost 2% of their wages. Now, for a second, close your eyes and think about your paycheck. Double it. That's what you, your wage would be today if productivity and income stayed together. So something really big happened here, really big to cause these lines uh, to fall apart, uh, to pull apart like this. Now, we are told that this is inevitable. This is the result of globalization. This is the result of automation and technology. Uh, and therefore, there's really not much you can do about it except make sure your kids get a good education. But to everybody else, the factory workers, former factory workers in the Rust Belt, uh, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, uh, in Michigan, nothing much you can do for them. Well, there's an interesting study that was done on this. It turns out, uh, this, and this is a really solid study, what causes this wage stagnation? About 10% technology. About 20% globalization. About 25% attacks on unions and cutbacks privatization of the public sector. And what's the big one? Financialization. Financialization, what does that mean? Now you have to stay for the 45 minute wrap. I can't give it to you. But I can tell you this. The person who came up with that word was in my graduate school class with me. And uh, uh, what it really means is the countries that have the most Wall Street-like operations have the highest inequality. And that's because of something we call financial strip mining. That's what the talk's about. That's what the book's about. Okay, so something 
really did happen bad to those people that voted for Obama looking for change, voted for Bernie looking for change, and then either didn't vote or voted for Trump and tossed the uh, Rust Belt into uh, Trump's column. And that's why we are stuck with what we're stuck with. Now, there's two takeaways. Now we get to the very end of the wrap. There's two takeaways from this. First of all, Runaway inequality will not cure itself. There's no ma magic pendulum in the economy. It doesn't swing back and forth. Oh, it's bad now, it'll get better. Not going to get better. Going to get worse. Going to get worse. Unless, and this is takeaway number two, and this is why I pray you're here, it's going to take a massive popular movement, a massive movement to turn this around. And these town hall meetings all over the country, if we can knit them together into a sustainable movement, we can change this country, we can take it back. So uh, two seconds on what I'm doing. Uh, I am not in a position to build a mass movement. I, don't, I represent five people at the Labor Institute. Uh, I'm not the president of a union that represents 600,000. But we are building the educational infrastructure for that movement. We are putting an army of educators together the way the populace did in the late 19th century. They had 6,000, they fought Wall Street at that time. They had 6,000, 6,000 educators that went around the country. All of, we th all of what we think of as progressive programs and progressive ideals grew out of that movement. We need 30,000, 30,000 to kind of match the population growth. So if you want to be part of that movement, if you want to help spread the word, keep involved with this organization and Go take a look at runawayinequality.org and sign up. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Les. So we have seen any number of stark contrasts between January 19th and January 21st this year. Uh, but Probably one of the most vivid for a lot of us is the corner that was turned from a president that spent a great deal of time and effort supporting the development of sustainable energy and supporting the transformation to that sustainable energy economy uh, and to a president who has literally appointed as the head of the Environmental Protection Agency an attorney general who sued it 13 times before he ran it. Um, Doug. Under a Trump administration, what are some of the biggest rollbacks we can expect on the environment? And what is Congress's role and Congressman Frulingheisen's role in either supporting the president or rolling him back in that regard? Uh, we should ask Flat Rodney that question, right? <laughs> um, so th th thank, you. thank you so much and thank you to all of you because, you know, really this you know, the, these moments in these days uh, remind me of, of our, our, our native son, Thomas Paine, who said, these are the times that try men's and women's souls. And, and that's, the, that's the kind of era we're living in. And I think every day under the Trump administration of these last few weeks, it's been hard to say, hey, I'm going to get up and I'm going to read the newspaper, newspaper, I'm going to engage in it. And obviously, all of you are doing that. And so I want to kind of talk about the environmental rollbacks that we're already starting to see. And um, as John mentioned, you know, we, we have an administrator of EPA who came out with a speech yesterday essentially attacking a toxic environment. But the toxic environment he was going after were the employees of the EPA for having the courage to say that Scott Pruitt should not be the nominee and should not be the administrator. And I think this is, you know, critical because, you know, we, you know, we know the environment is a bipartisan issue here in New Jersey. There's not a Republican Superfund site or a Democratic Superfund site. And quite frankly, all around this district, we have Superfund sites, including in Rodney's hometown in Harding and as well as in, in Wayne, in the old WR Grace uh, facility. Uh, you know, the, the, these are, are issues that hit all of us. And earlier in the congressman's career, the congressman actually had a decent record on standing up to some of the rollbacks from the Gingrich era. And I think it's, it's critical to remind ourselves, you know, that, that it, you know, just as, as Dan was saying, um, you know, the destiny of a congressional career is not entirely predicated on money or influence. It's, it's also about ambition and what you're willing to do with that. And Congressman Chris Smith, who is the former chairman of the Veterans Committee, 
ultimately got kicked off that committee because he was willing to stand up to the Bush administration. And obviously that's the le sort of leadership we would love to see Congressman Freeland high as an exhibit. But over the course of the last decade and a half, he has voted in lockstep with, uh, with his caucus in a way that makes him a, a true outlier uh, with, uh, you know, with his colleagues in, uh, in, New in New Jersey, not just the Democratic colleagues, but also the Republican ones. The closest colleague that Rodney has is the former Congressman Scott Garrett, um, who obviously lost his reelection because of a well-funded challenge by now Congressman Josh Gottheimer. And during his campaign, Josh kind of talked about his strategy for going after Congressman Scott Garrett. And he said, look, you know, the invisibleness of being a congressman is their biggest asset. And if people only pay attention during election time, that they would just see a pretty picture of former Congressman Scott Garrett walking along the stream with, uh, you know, supposedly his family talking about how much he cared about the environment. Instead, Congressman Garrett had a 0% score on Environment New Jersey scorecard. Unfortunately, Congressman Friedland-Heisen shares that record. And, and I think that this is perhaps the most kind of critical thing. You know, I know some of you have obviously been following Congressman Friedland-Heisen's record for a long time. Other of you are just saying, oh, this is the guy that represents me? And it's important to know that he is an outlier. And, and quite frankly, on the issues that affect all of us, he's on the wrong side of New Jersey. You know, let me just take the example of Superfund. Congressman Freelandheisen does a tour of sites in the district every summer. He does not mention in that tour, however, that he opposes the polluter fee to actually make the Superfund to clean up these sites. And we have not heard a single word from Congressman Freelandheisen on whether he's going to stand up to the funding cutbacks that we have already heard from Administrator Pruitt are coming. And those are cutbacks that are going to affect all of us because if EPA cuts of funding to New Jersey on clean water, that's going to mean less uh, programs and less cleanups uh, for our waterways. It's going to mean, uh, quite frankly, that we're going to see the Superfund program slow, t you know, it's already pretty glacial, it's going, to, it's going to come to a halt. And then finally, and I think this is very important, and when we're thinking about Congressman Freelandheisen not being at panels like this and town halls like this, uh, I think we'd want to ask him, come, come to Wayne, come to Little Falls, and come see the flooding that is in our communities, flooding that consistently gets worse, and flooding that is no accident. We are increasingly seeing the worst impacts uh, of extreme weather from climate change. We're seeing it most dramatically out in California, really going from drought to you know, downfalls that could break, uh, break a dam. But we see it here in New Jersey. We saw it during Hurricane Irene and Sandy. We're seeing our homes be flooded. We're seeing communities saying, it doesn't make sense for us to live here anymore. And these are the issues that Congressman Freelandheisen has been ducking. And as the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, he's going to have to make a choice. Am I going to stand for my constituents and the environment? Am I willing to stand up? Am I willing to go as far as Congressman Smith did and say and stand on principle and potentially be fired? Or is he going to toe the Trump administration line? And the most recent record from these votes in these last few weeks, it does not bode well. Congressman Freeland Eisen has a 0% on her scorecard. He's voted to gut protections that would prevent coal, monies, uh, coal, uh, coal companies from dumping their waste into streams. Uh, he's pushed to get rid of regulatory protections that would increase fuel efficiency uh, of our cars and trucks. Uh, and, he, and he's also said um, that he, uh, you know, he doesn't want to protect our special places in Alaska. So you know, at the end of the day, the congressman isn't looking too good tonight. And uh, you know, I think it's important for us to remi re remind ourselves that the environment should be bipartisan. It should be something we can all agree on, and we obviously hope that the congressman has, uh, you know, what do they say, a, a, a moment on the road to Damascus, a conversion on the road to Damascus. Thank you very much, Doug. Possibly the best segue ever, because Carol's going to talk a little bit about the road from Damascus. Um, Carol, you, you uh, are on the front lines of what is going on in the area of immigration and the experiences of immigrants and refugees uh, of all kinds of uh, documentation or lack thereof uh, here in, in uh, New Jersey, the struggles that they're facing, the concerns that they're experiencing. Um, tell us as we have the executive order from the very beginning of the administration, uh, Tuesday's memo from the Department of Homeland Security on how that's to be carried out. Tell us what you're seeing and what immigrants are experiencing right here on the ground in New Jersey. Thank you, Freeholder Bartlett, and 
to my fellow panelists and to all of you. Um, I, I want to wrap it all together. What is the immigrant community feeling? And we are feeling exactly what we've heard here today. Uh, when we hear about health care, immigrants in New Jersey are the doctors that are taking care of our children and the home health aides that are taking care of those of us that are, uh, that are ill or are elderly and in need of end-of-life care. Um, when we talk about the environment, the immigrants in New Jersey are the labor that cleaned up after Sandy. When we talk about immigrants in New Jersey and we talk about economy and productivity and inequality, it is immigrant labor that is exploited and exacerbates this inequality, and it is immigrant labor that increases the productivity in New Jersey and increases our tax base. As I hope you are all aware, um, immigrants do pay taxes and contribute billions into our tax coffers, which is more than we can say for our current president. So, <laughs> so our immigrant communities are impacted just the way that you all are. And as a member of the immigrant community, I do hear the panic and the fear. I've been telling the story lately that I, on the day that there were rumors in Morris County about immigration raids, I, I laid down for a nap after an extremely long, hard day, and I said, okay, I'm going to lay down for a nap for an hour, and then I'll get back up to keep fighting. I woke up to 55 texts from people in panic about immigration rates. That doesn't count the Facebook messages I received and the email messages that I received. Um, but because we are here to talk about Rodney Freelingheisen, uh, I want to highlight what Rodney Freelingheisen's position is, and I would also like to respond to some of your questions. So the first question we heard today that went unanswered, and, and silence is powerful, silence speaks, um, that, that question was about the Violence Against Women Act. And traditionally, the, not just the Obama administration, also the Bush administration, we have respected uh, victims and we have respected what are called sensitive locations. So that while immigration agents, ICE agents, um, and ICE is um, the enforcement arm of the Department of Homeland Security, while they do need to do their job as, as they are directed, they do not traditionally enter churches, schools, hospitals, and they do not arrest victims of violence on the allegation of uh, undocumented immigrant status of their abuser. That has changed. Since this new administration began, we've had, for example, in Texas, a woman who was a victim of violence was detained by ICE, um, and allegedly it was her abuser that called ICE, and that is in violation of immigration law. That is in violation of the principles of the Violence Against Women Act. So I, too, would like to know what Rodney Freelingheisen is going to do to protect all victims of violence, as he is required to do. Another question uh, asked and not answered was uh, about the wall. As, as we all know, Mexico is not paying for the wall. <laughs> and if Trump asks Congress to pass new laws to pay for the wall, the Democrats can filibuster. And given the way the Democrats operated um, in Congress under the Obama administration, and given their frustration with passing any legislation, I imagine they will be very excited to filibuster whenever they can. So we don't have Mexico, we don't have the Congress. So Trump then can rely on the Secure Fence Act of 2006. And I don't want to bore you with the law, that to me is fascinating and exciting. Um, but you, you may know that one of uh, our current administrations, and, and presumably Rodney Freelingheisen's as well, one of their favorite Supreme Court justices is the late Honorable Justice Scalia. And Justice Scalia is, as many of you know, a champion of state rights and a champion of um, funding whatever Congress mandates uh, appropriately and as necessary. So if Trump were to use the Secure Fence Act 
to fund uh, his promised wall, which he has estimated at about seven or eight billion dollars, and the more accurate estimation is 15 to 25 uh, billion dollars. If he were to try to depend on that Secure Fence Act, then he would be in violation of case law created by Justice Scalia because he would not be able to prove that that funding was appropriate and necessary. The wall is not necessary. Net z the immigration from Mexico at this point is net zero. And it is also not necessary because of the 11 to 12 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, the majority have overstayed visas. They did not cross the fence, the border. They did not climb over a wall. They came on a plane with a tourist visa, a fiance visa, a work visa, a student visa, and just stayed. So the wall is completely unnecessary. Another popular and untrue argument is that the wall may help, um, help fight crime. And it is a fact, a complete fact, not an alternative fact, a complete fact that immigrants, that immigrant communities commit less crime as compared to native born communities. So immigrants are not contributing to any actual or perceived crime problem we have here in New Jersey, much less in the country. We also know that um, Rodney Frillingheisen's offices are in Morristown, and Morristown is very dear to my heart. It's the first place I lived in this country after I did cross the border. So I'm, I'm one of those um, unliked immigrants. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, but Morristown, uh, we, we, we heard about the Tea Party and how they were born in Morristown. And there is a myth about the power of the Tea Party. Morristown, thanks to the leadership of immigrant communities and Wind of the Spirit Immigrant Resource Center, we are the only town in New Jersey, the only town in the country that was able to defeat 287G. And that is Secure Communities. That is the program that where local law enforcement becomes uh, an ICE agent and, and looks to terrorize immigrant communities and lose that sense of community policing and security, often, if not always, unfunded. And Morristown said, no way. Even the Morristown, the current Morristown police chief is not in support of 287G. And either are most police chiefs throughout the country. The majority of our police officers serve and protect, often risking their lives to protect a community. It is not their job to enforce federal immigration law, nor do they have the funding or resources to do so. And that, of course, we go, come back again to the Tenth Amendment um, argument that the current administration cannot commandeer Lo uh, local municipalities or states to do the job of federal government. That is against our Constitution and particularly against um, the principles that the Justice Scalia so espoused. And to actually respond to the question uh, posed by Freeling, uh, um, Freeholder Bartlett, our community is an absolute panic panic. They are afraid to call the police if they are victims of violence. I, I get calls, texts, and emails constantly. Children are afraid to go to school, either because they themselves are undocumented or because they're afraid they're not going to come home to their parents. There was a raid in Elizabeth, New Jersey. So there were increased immigrant um, ICE detainers in Newark in Dover, in Morristown. Our immigrant communities are suffering and the executive orders have called for uh, massive amounts of increase. I believe it was 10,000 in, in ICE agents and ICE officers. The executive orders call for decreased protection for asylum seekers. Refugees, as you may have seen in the news, are escaping the United States and braving 
ungodly conditions over the U.S.-Canada border because they are fearing the United States, a place where the Statue of Liberty stands, a place where we are supposed to welcome immigrants and refugees. And in the past, Congressman Freeling Heisen has said um, that he's vo he voted, for example, in 96 for what I call one of the worst immigration laws, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act, signed by President Clinton at the time, um, which has caused, the, the three laws passed in 96 have caused the havoc that we are experiencing now. Illegal immigration is not the fault of the immigrant, right? Hate the game, don't hate the player. The reason people are coming here and staying here without status is because we are not providing them any avenue to adjust their status. So I'll leave it at that and open up um, for the next segment. I could talk about this forever, so I apologize. Thank you. Wow. That. What an exceptional panel of experts we have. It almost makes you wish we had a member of Congress here to listen to all that he could learn. But we don't. So what we're going to do now is I want to open the uh, room up to questions. Uh, Siley and John are going to be walking around with the microphones as they were earlier. I want to encourage you as earlier to keep your questions brief, keep them topical, direct them to one panelist or to everyone. And to my panelists, because we only have all together about 10, maybe 15 minutes here, what I want to encourage you to do in your answers is both be brief but also focus on the the congressional policy piece of this. We're all frustrated about 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, but it's the other end of the boulevard where our congressman represents us and what can he and his colleagues, what should he and his colleagues be doing on the issues we're talking about. So, please. So my name is Jamie, I'm from Montclair. Um, I actually have a question for the first speaker. I think your name was Dan. Yes, okay. So in your pyramid structure, you show that the, really the way to get at the core of Freelingheiser is to really make him fear that he won't get elected again. So how, if this, you know, is this enough? Is what we're doing enough to shake that boat? Or do we need to do more? And if so, what should we be doing? So I, I should say that groups like this around the country are actually shaking the boat a lot. Uh, so members of Congress are used to having a, sp a spurt of constituent interest, and then that interest going away. And they have not seen since the Tea Party um, any sustained contact from constituents lasting more than a few weeks. If this lasts for several months, then members of Congress are going to say, okay, I don't know what this is, and now I'm scared. And they're risk averse enough in general that they will then start to change behavior in response to that. The other thing is there has to be, for Representative Franklin, the problem is he has not faced what we would term a qualified challenger since he has been in Congress. A qualified challenger in, for political scientists is someone who holds political office already or is well known in the district, can raise somewhere around $2 million. Right now, Rodney's spending about $1.2 million on re-election. He has a, a challenger to beat him would have to outspend him. If he believes that something unprecedented is happening, he may change his behavior. If he believes he is facing a real challenge, and that his votes matter, then he will absolutely change his behavior. Is this enough? Not yet, but it can get there. My name is uh, Ed from Riverdale. And first of all, thank you very much. I mean, what a wonderful way to spend an evening to get educated. Um, <laughs> so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Carol, um, your, your, your um, information was extraordinary. The lack of compassion about what's going on with the immigrant community is startling. And from a value system, this goes 180 degrees away from how I was raised and what I believe. But I also understand the immigrant question is totally on one side and being voiced by bullies in one regard. Because they're attacking the immigrants. And the immigrants come here for a better life, for jobs, and yet the people who are bringing them here are the job creators, and we're not penalizing them. 
We're not punishing the people who are hiring these people, knowing that they actually have very little say about what happens. The recommendation right now for regulations, very new regulation you want, you have to you know, take away two to, to, to have one. Well, my recommendation about immigration is for every immigrant that you deport, you find two guys who hired those. That will get hurt them in the pocketbook. book. So if I, if I just may speak to that, immigration is very complex and we have tried to be punitive. We are not going to punish um, people that hire immigrants because corporations make a lot of money on the immigrant, um, with immigrant labor, and in fact, it seeps into slavery. And I'm not using that word lightly. I know what that word means and how painful that word is. Uh, if you look up, for example, the Immokalee workers, there were... Um, farm workers that were enslaved in chains because they were working on the farms and unpaid. So we are not going to punish the workers, or I'm sorry, the employers, because when you do that, you're punishing the restaurant owner who may himself be an, uh, an immigrant. You are punishing the store owner, the teacher, the, the, the family that just wants someone to help care for their child or their uh, grandmother. So it would need to go after the corporations, not an employer, but the corporations. And those corporations fund, um, for example, congressmen, uh, several congressmen and women can be funded by corporations that benefit from the exploitation of immigrant labor. So we want to be careful to be restorative, uh, using the term restorative justice, and reformative and humane, and not look to punish somebody, someone. We need to fix the system as a whole. Uh, I'm Mike from Bloomingdale, and I have a question actually for the audience. How many people here have ever actually voted for Freeling Eisen? Wow. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm really surprised because I'm worried that we're preaching to the choir here. And we need to expand our concern to the Republicans who are not, let me say, by the way, I've never voted for them and never will. But we need to expand our concern to people the people in this room, uh, is there a chance that we can get them voting for a Democrat? Maybe, but only maybe. So I really think we need to work on finding a responsible alternative candidate to him. I, I want... I want to take my, take my moderator's privilege and pick up on that and the first question that we had and ask the panel, each of you in your own way has been an organizer as well as a scholar on your issues. Les, for example, you were telling me about your early work in political organizing. Um, how do, I mean, the question was, is this enough? And this isn't enough, but it's getting there. Everybody in this room can think of the neighbor next door, the one across the street, the one down over here. How do these folks go back to their neighborhoods, go back to their streets, their cul-de-sacs, their apartment buildings, and talk about what we've learned today and talk about the issues of congressional representation here in the 11th in a way that's going to turn this room into a bigger and a bigger and a bigger room going forward. Any, anybody? I have a short, quick answer. Carry voter registration forms with you in your car, in your purse, in your bag. Always carry them with you. It's the unregistered voters, the poor communities. Um, I, I think Les mentioned those that may have voted for Trump out of desperation the communities of color that, we're, that we often ignore. Um, the immigrants, some of us are citizens and can vote. So carry voter registration forms. Um, hi. I guess my biggest uh, point is that if we can set up educational settings, that safe space where people can come together in a common learning situation, and we can move, I don't know about the hard Republicans, but we can certainly move the independents, which I suspect have been a big part of his uh, constituency, whatever. Uh, the place, a good educational forums are the absolute best place to have a dialogue. How to get people there, that's another question, but I would encourage us to think that through uh, very carefully. So uh, just to pick up what I said before, I would, I would say whatever you're doing, 
contacting your congressman, that needs to continue. If you can sustain that, if you can turn this into something that is unprecedented, members of Congress are incredibly risk averse. If you can show them this is not going away, if you can put the fear of God and the fear of the constituents and members of Congress, they will change their behavior. And they can be trained. I mean, they're not, I'm not here to tell you what way you should go, but whatever you want a member of Congress to do, if they are scared, they'll go ahead and they will do it. So keep, it, keep up the work if you want the behavior to change. Um, you know what, I'll just... um, hi, I'm Christina from Montclair. Um, my question, I'm sort of, I'm very new to all of this. Um, I'm wondering, is it possible to get donor records? Are they a matter of public record? Um, who has made donations to the congressman? And is that something we can use as another kind of influence, like a boycott kind of thing? Uh, the answer is absolutely. So you can go to the FEC website, that's fec.gov, or to Open Secrets, and they will, uh, you can actually search, and they will show you every single person who gave to Congressman Freeland's campaign up until the last uh, quarter. Uh, most of the time, you're going to see it's groups that gave, that maxed out around $5,000. That's about the maximum contribution per cycle. Uh, and it's going to be, it's a lot of law firms. It's a lot of big corporations. Uh, the question is, if you m make it clear to those corporations, you call the corporation and say, hey, I see you're representing a political group I don't like. I, I don't like that. Uh, that has in the past proven to have some efficacy. That these groups, they don't want to, they don't, they, corporations are not giving money. They don't want to have chase any blowback from it. It's not worth it to them. Uh, so if there are public-facing companies, when uh, referencing Freeland's case, it's mostly law firms. Uh, but if there are public-facing companies, it absolutely makes sense to talk to them about it. Yeah. Absolutely. I've looked at Rodney Freeling Heisen's contributions, and of the top ten contributors, I would say the top seven are all defense contractors. <laughs> They're not public-facing corporations, but that does give you a sense of priority. Uh, and also, his second highest individual donor is a guy by the name Paul Singer, uh, a hedge fund uh, billionaire whose top priority is gutting banking regulation. He is out to gut the Dodd-Frank Act uh, and abolish the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And so that, would, that might be a very reasonable thing to ask Rodney. Hi, I'm maybe. I'm just going to Exactly. I, I would add to that an asterisk and another little piece of information. At the state level, the same information is available on the quarterly reports that we elected officials and candidates file. That's elect.state.nj.us. I can give you that again later. But that's all the, the transparent stuff. That's the campaigns, the stuff that we as, as elected officials uh, report and our treasurers track and so forth. We are also living in an era of super PACs and of Citizens United, private uh, so-called independent expenditures. Um, are those of concern in a place like the New Jersey 11th? I, so I, I have looked at the data. We don't, in New Jersey 11, New Jersey, right, the downside of living where we live is that, because I live in District 2, is that everything is really, really expensive. The upside is that it's really, really expensive for groups to come in. Um, so if you want to run TV ads in NJ11, you are buying ads in the New York media market, the most expensive media market in the country. And if you are running a super PAC, you go, you know what? I think Iowa is very nice this time of year. I think I'd rather run ads in Des Moines. Uh, and you can have a lot more influence that way. So no, we don't actually see a lot of super PAC spending here. Uh, we have seen some dark money spending coming in, mostly in the form of mailers. So you will get some unaccountable mailers. Uh, actually, we've already seen some for the governor's race. So you get some unaccountable mailers, but it's generally pretty light just because it is so expensive to campaign here. And also, Representative Frankenloisen uh, raises far more money than he needs, and so he doesn't really need any outside help. We've seen a little bit. Uh, there was an ad in the Star Ledger a couple weeks ago saying, call Representative Frankenloisen and thank him for his plan on health care, which his office was very upset about because they said, we don't have a plan. What are you talking about? Um, uh, but regardless, so we are seeing a little bit of that, but that's not a major factor here in NJ11. So we can get three, four Midwestern congressmen for the price of one New Jersey? Okay. Who's next? Um, I'm Mady. I live in Wayne, New Jersey. Um, um, one of the real concerns I have about um, re-elections is the gerrymandering of a district. And no matter who we, um, if, if Freelinghausen can win an election by 60 to 40 or even higher amounts than that, I, I wonder no matter who you put up against him, how you, um, you know, flip the district. 
I mean, how do you do that? I mean, there was even Gottheimer and um, Garrett when they ran against each other. It really came down to lots and lots of money, and even that was a nail biter, so to speak. And nothing's going to happen with district lines until they do the next um, census. So, I mean, it, it almost seems like they were all over the country. There are so many districts that are quote unquote guaranteed this or guaranteed that. And for many years, Pascal was my uh, representative until they redrew the lines. And I mean, it's almost like you're, it's like an uphill battle every I, time. No, look, I, I think there's a misunderstanding with the way gerrymandering works. So we have to understand we are in a district, so even though we have a bipartisan uh, gerrymandering system in New Jersey, it's actually an equal number of Republicans and Democrats and one poor, poor professor from Rutgers who has to be the tiebreaker vote on it. Um, and it's actually the vote he cast was for the Republican side. So the Republicans did the redistrict even though we're a Democratic state. But people think you try and create a safe district. If I'm a Republican and I'm drawing a Republican district and I draw a district that's 90% Republican, I have screwed up. You do not do that. What you do is you do what's called stacking and cracking. You stack your opponents, you create a district like NJ1, which is going to be you know 88% Democratic, something like that. And then you create a district like NJ11 that's very tight. You want to get as tight as you can get it. You want it to be 55-45 to make sure the guy's going to win but not by enough, because every vote you have over 50% plus one is a wasted vote you could be putting towards another district. So Representative Frelinghuysen's district has actually gotten much less safe since the 2010 reapportionment. This, the reason that uh, Montclair and Bloomfield and other, let's be honest, Democratic-leaning towns are in Congressman Frelinghuysen's district is they were trying to make his district more Democratic so that there'll be fewer wasted Republican votes that they could then put into districts to defend other Republican districts. The reason Congressman Franklin wins with 65% of the vote every time is not because this is a 65% Republican district. It's because turnout in New Jersey elections is abominably low. And we set new records every year on how bad our turnout gets. And second, because he has not faced a qualified challenger. If you put up someone, uh, they put up last term was a very nice gentleman. He raised about $200,000. If you put up someone with no name recognition who raises $200,000, who cannot afford to run any ads, no one who this person is, they've got no strong connections, they are put up there by the Democrats as a sacrificial lamb. Representative Frelinghuysen, uh, the one of the reasons he shuns the media is because in the 1990s, Michael Moore ran a ficus against him because no one was running against him. There is... Li if The ficus. The, this is what... After that, he got very gun-shy for some reason. <laughs> I, and so, if there is a qualified challenger, he will not win by 65 points. He might win by 5 points, but he will not win by 30 points like he has in the past. It is a lack of challengers. The reason most members of Congress keep on winning is because no one challenges them. And when a member of Congress feels like they could be challenged, they tend to mostly just retire because it's not worth the effort to really fight to keep a seat. So. If there is a qualified challenger, no, he will not win by that margin. This district is not nearly as safe as it used to be, especially when groups like this that got gerrymandered in his district are this active. And I just, I just want to add to the qualified challenger. Um, I want to make sure that all of you, especially the women in the room, are taking training to be ready to run. If you can run this town hall, you can run for local office and eventually, or right away, for the congressman's seat. For those of you who haven't heard of it, Ready to Run is run by the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University. It's coming up uh, March 10th and 11th this year. Uh, you can uh, sign up online. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Kelly Davidson. I'm from Butler. Uh, I couldn't make it to the Morris County. Uh, this is an environmental question. <laughs> um, I'm concerned about the Pilgrim pipeline and um, with Pruitt going into the EPA seat, I'm afraid they're going to push it through before Christie's out of office because it's been stalled. If you all don't know about the Pilgrim pipeline, it's a pipeline that's going to be 170 miles long, running from Albany all the way down to Linden. It is running through uh, Five New Jersey counties, six New York counties, 30 New Jersey towns, 20 New York municipalities, and environmentally fragile areas. Um, it's also running through the part of the Highlands. It's also running through Ramapo Reservation. So it's been called the new DAPL, 
of Northeast. Um, I'm just, I know that it's been stalled, but I just, I'm concerned of what, what we can do to stop it if they try to push it through, like the Keystone and the DAPL. Well, well, this is a great question, because quite frankly, when a pipeline is coming through your backyard, you're not a Republican or a Democrat, you're opposed to the pipeline. And we've seen that all throughout New Jersey, where suddenly, you know, some of the most conservative members of the legislature get up at public hearings and say, I don't like this out-of-state energy company coming in and using eminent domain to plow through open space money that all of us paid for uh, and to allow uh, you know, a fossil fuel company to double down on carbon emissions. So you know, the, pipeline on, the pipeline fights that we've seen on Pilgrim, are, you know, Pilgrim is not unique. Um, we have a, a vote in, in f less than 48 hours down in South Jersey in the South Jersey gas, uh, South Jersey gas pipeline through the Pinelands. Uh, we're, we're obviously really worried about that vote. Governor Christie has stacked the commission. He's even fired members of the Pinelands Commission that voted the right way more than three years ago. Um, and the, the thing to know is that, you know, we, we don't know if we're going to win that vote in Cherry Hill, but we're obviously encouraging everyone to come down there on Friday morning at 9.30 a.m. And, you know, we have seen a unique movement in New Jersey that whether you live in Mercer or Hunterdon County, whether you live in, down in, in the Pines and in, in Ocean County, whether you live in Morris County, people are coming together to stop this. Now, obviously, Trump, we know what Trump thinks about pipelines, but there are a lot of approvals on the state level that are needed. And specifically, uh, you know, Pilgrim needs DEP sign off. We're in a race really to January 2018. South Jersey Gas. Uh, you know, we, we, we got to keep our, our fingers crossed and we got to get ready to, to sue if we lose that vote on Friday. Pilgrim, I'm a little more optimistic on because uh, supposedly our Republican, uh, you know, legislators are, are against it. And, and I think this is going to be a moment of truth, including for Congressman Freelandheisen. Is the Congressman going to stand up against these projects when it's more likely to get a federal approval? And so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about a lot of pipeline projects in the state. Pilgrim's on the list, um, but you know this is the this is the time to kind of go after our Rodneys and ask them where they are. Right, it's easy, it's easy to vote for something they can't win or vote against something they can't lose, but not the other way around. Uh, who's next? Uh, back to the question of flipping the district, which is you know as you pointed out rather difficult. Uh, I was curious if uh, what uh, Republican congressmen typically live in fear of is being primaried from the right. That someone comes in from the right is more conservative than them, which would be pretty hard with his voting record. And that person pushes him out in the primary where there are very, very few votes. Is, have you ever heard of anyone being primaried, a Republican primaried from the left? In other words, if we all registered as Republicans or got 30,000 people in this group, <laughs> Can we flip a Republican primary? Uh, the, answer is, uh, the answer is in theory, yes. In practice, it has been tried uh, and it has, it has never worked. Uh, in all honesty, it is really, really hard to get people to vote. Uh, and if we compound that by getting people to re-register and then get people to vote for someone they don't really believe in. And then uh, I, 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 there's political consultants who would, this is a Hail Mary pass from political consultants. Uh, it's never worked. There's no evidence it's ever been happened on very large. Now, could, it, could you sponsor a Republican from the left? Uh, I would say maybe in other states you might have a better chance. In New Jersey, uh, it's very difficult because of the way the primary system works. In New Jersey, we do not like primary elections. We do everything we can to avoid primary elections. We give the county bosses control over the ballot. And all that matters, basically, and you'll find this during the governor's election, is who the county bosses supported the primary. The county bosses and the city bosses choose their candidate. Uh, so if you were to have that sort of candidate, that candidate would be listed somewhere between, you know, X and Z on the ballot way down at the bottom. Uh, it's not feasible uh, to do it just because we have in New Jersey a system that is set up to stop exactly this sort of thing from happening and to keep the political machine system we have in place, unfortunately. Okay, who wants to take us out on a high positive note? Yeah, Last I'm one. I'm really a downer tonight, Mike. Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Todd. I'm from West Orange. And uh, I'm a union member. I'm in IATSE, which is the entertainment and uh, union. We make all the movies. We do all the shows. We work on Broadway. I'm in Local 1 and I'm in Local 52. Local 1 is the stagehands uh, un local in uh, New York City. 
and uh, 52 is the TV and uh, movie local um, in uh, the whole metropolitan area, actually. Um, there is a piece of legislation that's in the House right now. Um, I don't know where it is in the House at the moment, but um, it's called the right, National Right to Work uh, Bill. Um, it is basically what it says is um, union members have to pay dues, and the dues support the union. Um, the right, national right to, there are right to work states already, but this would be a national bill which says that if uh, a union member can opt to not pay dues, and uh, what would happen would be uh, devastating for unions because uh, it would deprive them of any operating funds. Um, I would like to know what Congressman Freelinghausen uh, thinks about this and which way he's going to vote if it comes up to the floor. Uh, it, may, it may not, but, uh, and I'd also like to ask Tom because uh, I think you have something, some knowledge of union well, things. Well, thank you. As, yeah. as a former uh, United Auto Workers member of Local 2179, fortunately for me at least, I didn't have to work in an auto factory to belong to the UAW. I worked for a consulting firm that was unionized. In fact, we organized the union. Uh, and when Donald Trump was elected with the votes of many union members throughout the Midwest. A lot of Republicans said, huh, maybe uh, working people who belong to unions would vote for us if we stress issues that you know, they think are important. But the fact is, people will vote for you if they know that you have your best interests at heart or if they think you have their best interests at heart. And now that Congress is considering a bill that would cripple the ability of working people to organize for collective bargaining, I think that really reveals the agenda of the governing party in Congress. And it is absolutely a fair question to ask of uh, Congressman Frelinghuysen, whether he supports working people or whether he supports legislation that would cripple their ability to have unions and to improve their working conditions, their salary, and their benefits, and their control over their workplace. Thank you. All right, well, this has been incredibly informative, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Let's give our panel one more round of applause. Thank you to everybody who came out. Thank you to everybody who watched online. Let me let uh, Elizabeth close it out for us. Thank you, and, and thank you, John Bartlett, for being such a fantastic and generous. This was amazing. Just one more minute, just one more minute. I just, we've thanked this extraordinary panel. This was really a privilege to walk in free to a union hall and get this kind of education. It's really extraordinary. But I want you to give yourselves a round of applause because there is nothing happening in New Jersey 11th for change that isn't you making it happen. Nothing. Thank you. Except for the website. You didn't make the website happen, but you can make it run. So Dan, you gave me a, a wonderful little lead. It is very expensive to run a campaign here in New Jersey. There are not a lot of super PACs, but there's a new one on the block, and it's called... NJ 11th for change. We've registered. We have a little donate button on our website. $11 makes it run. 11 for 11. And I just want to give you one piece of information you probably already know. The amount of money is obviously very important, but the number of people giving is huge. It makes candidates look at this district as a reasonable place to run, and it makes parties look at this district as a reasonable place for a progressive person to run. So 11, five, four, three, dollars $1,100, nj11thforchange.org, and you can pick up your swag on the way out. One more quote. Super PACs are a fancy word for political, educational, not-for-profits. And that is absolutely our mission, and you are our teachers. Educate yourselves, go educate, educate your neighbors, educate your coworkers, your friends, your social media people. Little quote from FDR, the real safeguard to democracy is education. <laughs>